we'll get going straight away. So first of all, thanks to everyone for coming. It's the first time trying this now. So as I said, uh, ignore the, the glitches and the whatever errors we make along the way. Um, but we've only got about 30 minutes of time. So what we'll do is we'll just make it as, try to get through it as fast as we can. If you have any questions, throw them into the chat. I'll try to get to them at the end if we have time, okay? But other than that, we're just going to go straight into the presentation. And what it is, is we're just going to be, uh, I suppose what I'm titling it is planning for the season. Um, so your guide for coaching um, at, at juvenile level and the plan you make as a coach. So look, as I said, we're just trying to come up with ideas for ourselves as GDAs to stay active and keep, keep communicating with coaches. And we're just trying to come up with a few of these and maybe this might be an avenue that we might try in the future. So um, contents, what we go through is why plan, how to plan, design and filling in a template, a very simple template and contact details. Um, so what we're trying to do tonight is just to plan for the season ahead for underage coaching. Um, Anyone that's doing it already, you might find a huge amount of it, but anyone who's not putting in place a plan for the year, you'll actually, hopefully, you'll get something very beneficial out of it, okay? Um, so we'll go through that as, as we're going through. Now, as I said, it's not going to make you a perfect coach. It's not going to put your plan in perfectly, but it could, if you're not doing it already, it could put you about 60%, and the last 40% in is up to yourself and how proactive you are as a coach and stuff like that. So why plan to link in with a club development plan? So most clubs now have a development plan at underage level for coaching and stuff like that. So it's important to link in with that um, to ensure age-appropriate content, to ensure there's a correct proportion of physical, technical, tactical, and team play elements are incorporated throughout the season. And those, those will vary throughout the season, but they'll also vary from age group to age group. Um, to ensure sessions are proactive and not reactive to the last game and session. So it's just to ensure that well, what happens in the past if a GA is that if your team, if you have a match at the weekend and something goes bad, you get beaten, you'll find a number of flaws. And what you'll do is you'll react to that and the next training session, you'll work that, um, you'll try to improve that, the, the flaws that you had the last time, as opposed to staying on a kind of a long-term plan. Um, in short, that each player develops from start to the end, start of the year to the end of the year. And that's basically, where do we want the child at the start of the year, and where do we want them at the end of the year? So I said it could be something as simple as we want an under-12 kid, by the end of their under-12 year, that they're able to kick the ball left foot and right foot from 20 yards over the barrel uncontested. Um, so things like that, they could be vary from age group to age group. So how to plan? Um, so a goal without a plan is just a wish. So it's very important that we have some sort of an, an idea in our head what we're doing for the year. So access the club coaching plan and find your age group. So a lot of club coaching plans break it down by age group, what content should be coached and stuff like that. So make sure you have a look at that so you're linking in with what the club's goals are. Um, from a technical point of view, what skills are age appropriate and need to be introduced this year? Um, so if you're with the under eights, there'll be new skills introduced at under eight level that weren't there at under seven. Um, so rather than trying to do all 20 skills straight off the start, um, it's, a, it's a case of doing them bit by bit as the year goes on. Um, good, thanks, Brian. Uh, physical, just what stage of physical development are the players at and what time of season should we do the different aspects should be prioritized. Um, again, as they get older, this is more specific to um, I'll show you a slide in a minute, just of an adult, an adult season planner. Um, and, but, but for children, it's not as huge an issue. So for tactical and team play is what levels of tactical and team play is recommended for the respective age group. Again, for a group of seven-year-olds, just getting to know each other and being able to pass the ball might be enough tactical and team play for them. At under 13, 14, it might be getting a little bit more um, team play in what happens in certain scenarios on the pitch and stuff like that. So we'll go through, we'll try to integrate that into the plan. So very simple. Um, I hope you can all see the, see the screen there. And what, what it is, I've broken the season into from February to November, just imagining that there's a, a down season from December and January. Um, and down to the left-hand side there, you'll see on the, on, the, on the rows, we got activity, core skill, associate skill, um, defensive skill, physical types of session, session um, explanations and comments. So what I'll do is I'll just go through um, each of them and how you can do it. So what I've used in here is an under 10 session plan for Hurley. And it's very easy for you as a coach then yourself to put in your own age group and what you see might suit them, okay, as regards skills as well. So activity, let's say for an under 10 age group, um, that they might have an indoor league, an indoor program in February and again in November, be it an indoor hurling internal league or against local clubs. Um, from March to June in Cork, we have the Go Games Blitz, Blitz program as well as, and I know Dublin has the same, um, in July and August, summer league program for the first two weeks in August. 
And then the Go Game Splits kicks off then again from the end of August till probably the middle to end of October or the November back into an indoor league program then again. So it's just breaking down your, your season as to what you're actually doing and when you're doing it. Um, so that's all that is. It's very simple. As I said, most of them are the same. It's generic enough. Uh, not going to change hugely. Again, for an adult, for an older team, you might have championship in May, July and August. Uh, you might have league games in March, April, June and stuff like that. So you can peak different times for different different areas. But for, for underage, for under 12, 13 down, it's, uh, it's very much just season kind of runs. Every game is important as each other. And the importance that you put on it is, is applicable to each one, each game. Uh, so the next section is the core skill and associate skills. So for hurling and football, I'd be very much of the opinion that the core skill should take the priority in every single session. And for hurling, the, the core skill is striking the ball. Um, so you can see there we've got for the first three months of the year, strike from the hand under run. And for the rest of the year, strike from the hand under pressure. So that would have progressed that under nine, they would have did strike from the hand under run. Um, for half the year, they would have did striking from the hand for half the year. And at under eight, towards the end of the year, they would have did striking from the hand. So every kind of, every skill may be over the course of, let's say, equates to about eight to nine months, would be working on, on something to do with striking. So with, with hurling, striking just progresses from skill from year to year. So at under five, they might be just striking ground strike. At under six, ground strike and the run. At under seven, uh, ground strike and the run left and right. You know, so it progresses year on year. But the skill of the of striking the ball is the most important skill in hurling. Same in football. The most important skill in football is is uh, is kicking the football. So being able to, as I said, for it might be a four year old might be kicking the ball on the ground. At five, they might be doing a drop kick. At six, they're progressing up year on year, and it could be kicking the ball, hook kick under pressure. At under ten, might be the target. So again what your club plan will dictate as to what what is to, what is targeted and what age groups um so this is just a generic enough one that we did uh so the associate skill so let's say for we'll just look at february there the associate skill is a high catch and jab lift so the beauty of hurling football is that every time you do a skill there's complementary skills so if i'm kicking the ball to john who is 20 meters away um i'm going to kick it that'll be the skill that'll be the core skill that i'm working on but john will either be catching the ball he'll be um picking up the ball um and in hurling you've got control stopping the ball it could be a high catch it could be a low catch so there's a number of skills will complement each other by just pucking the ball to each other and kicking the ball to each other so we're never really doing a skill in isolation um on its own there's always complementary skills but the skills we want to focus on for what i say for february would be the high catch and the jab jab lift so to strike the ball on the run that will obviously what will happen on that is there'll be a lot of high balls going into players and we need to make them competent at catching the ball. Um, so as I said, over the course of the year, we've high catch in three times and they're getting a month block each time. Now, what we would like, what I would think would be ideal would be the first, you got four sessions with the high catch and you try to progress to four sessions from uncontested to semi-contested to, to basically being able to do it in a game by week four or as close as possible. No, that might be possible the first block in February, but in May, they'll get better at it. And in August, you'd like to think they'll be fairly competent at it. Same at the jab lift. So the jab lift at the uh, start of February might be a jab lift with um, jab lift in a game, such as Rob the Nest. Um, but as, as they progress, that there's more pressure put on them. It could be one-on-one, -on -one, running out to a ball, jab lifting the ball, turning and trying to put the ball over the bar. So that's a skill that we want to put in. Well, what this is also doing for you as a coach is it's actually making life easy for you that you know for February, you've only got three skills that you're going to focus on. So rather than going down and doing a bit of soloing and a bit of hooking and a bit of blocking and a bit of this and a bit of that, you're actually just focusing on three skills for the month um, when, you add, when you add in the defensive skills. So the striking will take up every single month and the high catch jab lift will be, the, will be for February. For March, you're moving on to batting a high ball and a ball control. So what you'll see then as well is that every associate skill is kind of complementary to the, to the core skill. So batting a high ball. So if a player is striking the ball in the run into you as a defender, you'll be batting the ball um, or high catch. Practice high catch last month. We're practicing the batting the high ball this month. So just adding a skill and adding a layer to it. And what we'll do is over four weeks, we'll try to really work on that skill so that we can improve that skill over the four weeks. So rather than just doing it once and not doing it for another six weeks, we're going to do it for four weeks solid and we're going to try to really improve it. 
Um, ball control would be another associate skill that if players striking the ball on the run, um, the ball, if it's not going over your head, it's coming down in front of you. So you need to be able to control the ball. So it's an associate skill. So you can see that, how that interlinks. Um, and what that does as well is it... Um, it makes it easy for the coach um, or let's say for, for the club, if you've got your plan in place that you know that, let's say, I'll just share another one here now. Um, I'll just share another one. What you can do as a club is you can put in place your structures that each year you're developing, you're introducing two or three new skills. So let's say at this group here, now you might be able to see this, at under five, they're, they're the three skills we're introducing. So at six, we introduce another three skills. At seven, we introduce another three skills. These skills are specific to the age group. They're tailored to the skill set that's available um, in that the role lift is appropriate for, a, maybe it wouldn't be appropriate for a five-year-old to be, to be learning, but it's not a bad skill for a seven-year-old to be introduced to. So you can do that. As I said, every club could have something similar to this. Very simple, just pick three skills age appropriate. Again, this isn't the perfect model. But what you can do is you can change and alter. And as they go to eight, nine, you can see that they have nearly all the skills from the age of five to nine. They're after doing 15 new skills in, it, in, in addition to the catching and kicking, catch, or the kicking and striking. So being able to, I suppose, take the value of that and being able to build a plan that every single year you're just developing three new skills, it makes life very, very easy. Um, so I'll just go back to the slide there. So as you can see there, you've got the jab lift um, and the, the, the associate skills. So I said, the new skills we're introducing at under 10, we're actually just, we're re going over skills that we learned at six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, um, and just taking them up to a little bit of a higher level. So the next one would be the defensive skill. So again, very important, especially with teams as they go up the levels up the age groups, um, that they're, they're competent in the skill of hooking, block down, tackling and hurling, uh, the block down of football, the near hand tackle in football. And, and, and as much from a safety aspect as anything else, like all these skills, the hook, we'd like to think that the under seven coach introduced it. I'm not saying they did everything with it, but they had it introduced to a basic level. Uh, the block down, again, we're spending four weeks doing the hook so that by week five, when we move on to the block down, if we're playing a game or playing a small sided game and training, they're competent in the hook. Um, so put in the defensive skill, it's important as well that you do just go tip on one defensive skill every every session. As I said, if you've only got them for an hour a week, um, we'll go through the times there now as we go down. Physical, a continuation of evasion and chase games as before. So this is from, this would be a plan, under 10 plan from plans that were gone before them at seven, eight, nine, ten, nine. 10, um, An introduction to explosive exercises such as frog jumps, um, squat jumps, body weight, exercises where they're doing a lot of animal movements um, and different type of movements that will help them not just in hurling football but in in life to being able to move better um, stability and balance exercises jumping and steady landing landing on one foot multi-directional jumps sprints and multi-directional movements with the ball um, so as i said a lot of most coaches would probably put that into the warm-up um, and we go through the time elements of that. But look, I'm not an expert in physical, I won't, I won't say I am, but there is people out there like John Murphy uh, at FHS um, Performance on Twitter, top class stuff um, that he's got that it might be more appropriate than my rough enough stuff there that I got as regards evasion and chase games. But lots of movement, lots of multi-directional movement, and lots of, if you can get in specific movements to the game as regards um, like chasing a player, in a game of flush the toilet or bulldog is highly appropriate to a player playing hurling in football. Um, so the type of sessions for under 10, we say they should be fun. The session should be mainly game space where possible. Um, now when I say that there's black game space, there's white drill based. It's not black nor white. It's somewhere in the middle um, and a gray level that suits yourself and suits your own age group. Um, so, sorry, one second, apologies. Sorry about that. Um, so, as I said, something that's that's um, not specific. Uh, it doesn't have to be 100% game-based and it doesn't have to be 100% um, drill-based, but it's finding a level of grey in the middle that suits your group. So you know them better than I do. There's no point in me saying you should do 100% game-based when you might have to do a few drill-based activities with some players just to get them to the level. Um, so stuff like that, small-sided games, 
are would be I'd say priority with maximum ball contacts. Try to eliminate straight line exercises where possible. And said, I know it's not always possible, but try to think: Can we do this in another way that might be more encouraging, to enlightening to the players? Um, yeah, John Murphy's Twitter handle is at FHS Performance. Um, I'll retweet it on my Twitter page anyway later on. The elimination of straight line, um, at least one ball per player. So as I said, if you're doing stuff like jab lifting, soloing and stuff like that, rather than waiting for somebody else to do it, um, have, have a ball per player. So as I said, it doesn't have to be a perfect and O'Neill size four. It could be a quick touch. It could be a first touch. It could be even a tennis ball. And in football, it's the same. Any type of football, the kids, while they prefer to have the, the proper first touch and quick touch and smart touches, they'll take any ball if they don't have a ball. Um, so as many balls as possible. Progression onto more man-on-man -on -man competition and trainings in real life situations. So I said, think about the skill and think about the, the match. You need to get the skill that they're doing in training to where they are, what happens in a match. So you need to be able to build that bridge. Um, so rather than doing a skill in isolation, doing jab lifting with nobody tackling, when they go out and play a team on a Saturday morning, there's somebody tackling, we need to be able to teach them that skill in the training session. So once they can do it uncontested, start raising up the levels, build the, build the layers onto the, phone, onto the house. The session, um, just rough, rough enough again, look, warm up. Let's say you have them for an hour, warm up, every five to 10 minutes. As I said, that's where you do your physical part, physical games. Um, you do your striking or exercise games. It should be, it should be 10 to 15 minutes minimum. Um, that it, like it is the core part of the, of the game of hurling is striking the ball and football is kicking the ball. So we need them to be competent to those skills. So we need to spend the time on that. So, but playing games such as no man's land, goal to goal, um, over the river, point shooting competitions, stuff like that, that'll encourage them and that'll engage them a little bit more. Associate skills, what I would say for the two associate skills and defensive skill, if you spend about five minutes on each of them um, on a night, that should be loads. You're talking, we're up to nearly 40 minutes of training session then. Um, that's including, the, let's say, all the skills and the warm up and all that. And the games then is probably the most important part. If the kids come and ask you, are we playing a game tonight? They want a game, you have to give them a game. I said kids at 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, probably they're still getting dropped up to the pitch by their parents. It's not their decision whether they come or go. But once they get to 13 or 14, if they're looking for games and they're not getting games, they'll decide themselves they don't want to go. So you need to be proactive to what their needs are and cater for their needs. I said it's not all about developing the player for the, to win the next match. It's a 15-year project. Um, so cater for their needs. Give the games. But in those games, let's say if in February, if we're playing a game at the end of training session and we're after working on the hook and the high catch as the associate skills, we're given a bonus point if a player gets a high catch. We're given a bonus point if a player gets a hook or we're giving them a free or something. But we're trying to refigure the exercises that they did. We're trying to get them back, a reminder of that in the game. that they can, And if they can execute it in, the, in a game in the training session, they'll execute it in the game in the match. So it's very important, uh, simple things like that, that you just... Bring back the stuff that you do. How is it important? By putting it as a, as a reward in the game. Um, so just simple things like that. Um, last, last few bits on it would be the explanations. I've gone through them. The activity, the core skills, the associate skills, defensive skills, physical type session um, sessions. Comment. Um, obviously, it's impossible to incorporate, if possible, to incorporate more skills in a training session. Then brilliant. Um, but the idea of the matrix here is just that as a coach, that you're not neglecting any skills throughout the year. So. If at under nine, you're after going through three new skills, you're after introducing them. At 10, let's make sure we're working on something again. So be it gaining possession, maintaining possession, um, challenging possession, and retaining possession. So whatever sector of that you need to work on, put it into the block and keep working on that throughout the year. Um, the, it's, it's not, as I said, what I said earlier on, this isn't go an end product. If you take this and copy it, that'll only take you 60% of the way there. Some clubs are, are way ahead of this already. Some of you are probably looking at this going, ah, we have a better program already. That's great. What we want though is we want every, every coach and every child to be at a minimum level. And if every child is at 60%, well, isn't that a great, that's a good start. The last 40% then is up to you as a coach and what you actually bring to the table. Um, as, as a coach and as a person. Um, so be conscious of them as children. Um, as I said earlier on, the beauty of hurling football is that skills are very rarely done in isolation unless you set up a drill that does that. But if I'm passing a ball to a partner, 
he's getting the partner is getting something as well that's complementary to what the main skill is. Um, so as I said, from from a pers perspective of never neglecting a skill, just be conscious of what you're doing. No, as I said, the beauty of this is as a coach, you know, for February, you've got striking, high catch, jab, lift, hook. That's let's make four progressions for each one of them. Let's do them every week in the training session. And life gets very easy for you as a coach when you're driving up to the pitch straight after work, after picking up the young fella or the daughter, and you're going up to the pitch and going, Jesus, what are we going to do tonight? No, you know, you know, you got to do something for a high catch, something for a jab lift, something for a hook. And if you've got to treat them in your head and the rest of it is taken off, or taken out of the equation, it makes it very easy for you as a coach. Okay. So um, that's a small bit of it. Okay. So to help plan, what I would suggest would be talk to the mentors from the age up uh, about what they did last year. So if you're under, under 10 mentor, mentor this year, talk to last year's under 10 mentor. What did they do? Anything they found they struggled with? Anything they do differently if they do it in again? It might just readjust what you're doing in your plan a small bit. Um, best practice content from technical and physical perspectives. So I said, I spoke about John Murphy there. Um, John has top class physical activity stuff. Um, he really is top class. Uh, I'd advise him over, I suppose, anybody else. For the younger age groups, he got stuff from, um, like I know Stephen Bean did, did some research lately. And, but there is just so much good content out there um, available. Uh, from a physical perspective. So as I said, find what's best. As I said, don't just take the lazy option and go, what, what's there already? Check it out. Is there something better? What are these people? What is the latest? Because coaching is constantly changing and constantly evolving. And the same from a technical point of view. So as I said, if you were talking of technical, um, 15 years ago, I'd say the Fundu pack came out. It was top of the range. It was like not never seen before. Now, all of a sudden, the fundu pack is a bit outdated. There's an awful lot of drills in it, an awful lot of straight line stuff, uncontested. And now we're going, can we make that more game-based? So that's what Crow Park are working on at the moment. So coaching is evolving all the time. So keep checking yourself what's next. As I said, you obviously have an interest by even being here tonight. Um, so hopefully, you'll be able to take that going forward. Last thing, a player takes 15 years to develop. You won't do it in one session. There is this obsession that we want to have the best team this year and the best player this year and the best team at the next session and the next match. But players from the age of five to the age of 50, to the age of 20, they're going to develop at their own rate. And it's important that you put in place a plan for the very start that if you know what you're going to do in a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and you've got to plan the whole way rather than jumping to say, oh, do you know what? We got well beaten in the match the other day because we weren't doing enough high catching. Let's do high catching instead of blocking down the next session. If you have a plan, follow it through, stick with it. Um, but it's very important that you don't just throw the bat, throw the child over the bat water. Be, everything takes time. Be patient and take your time with it. Down the bottom there, I've got my Dropbox. Um, just that's the link to the to the, the link to that. Um, so that'll just give you an idea. What I'll do as well is I'll throw up a, a Word template of that as well. So you can just copy that off the Dropbox and you can take it into, you can fill it out for yourself, for your own age group. Um, I'll just give you a quick look of um, just an adult section one. Uh, I won't go through this. Um, so this here is just a quick look of an adult section one. So this is killer seniors last this year. So uh, just going through as regards, we got competition phase, training phase, fitness, intensity, volume, peaking skills. So you can see the level it goes to at adult level. Um, so, but as I said, we are, um, we won't be going to that level, I'm afraid. So one second, I'll see if I can get that up again. Sorry. So there it is. It's, um, it's fairly, fairly, um, there's a lot to it, but there's, there's a lot out there with more stuff. Um, so anyone interested in that, Kieran Dealey has some top class information um, that you can see on his website, Dealey Sports Science. Um, so other than that, just going back to the last one then. So where, sorry. Um, so we're, that's, I'll throw up a word template of that um, without, without the content. So I'll give you the dates and I'll give you the associate skills. I'll leave in the explanations and you can fill that in yourself. But as I said, it's very easy and it's very helpful for you as a coach to have some sort of a plan for the year. Um, last thing, as I said, I put up the Dropbox. There are my contact details. If anyone has any, one second now, do we have any questions? Um, fire them at me for a few minutes if there is any questions out there. Um, one second now, just let me see if we can get the chat up. 
I'll just stop this. Okay, John Murphy, so John Murphy is at FHSP. That's John Murphy's uh, Twitter handle. Um, I'll throw up a blank adult one on the, on the, the Dropbox. Um, so there's a, I've, um, that one, it was just, it was done, but it said that that one now was done for a team this year and that'll be thrown out now at the moment. But if there's any questions, if anyone has a few questions on chat, feel free to fire them at me for a few minutes. Um, Brian was right to have extended to 40 minutes for the time being. So Zoom free service or have you paid a fee? I've, this is a free service, so that's why there was a 40 minute limit on it, um, but you can pay a fee. I think it's only 13 euro a month, which seems like it's helpful. Um, I'm not too sure of other, as someone said, Google Hangouts is another good resource, but uh, what I've done tonight is free. Um, so you can have up to 100 people on it and everybody can talk. I've you all muted tonight in case you're wondering. Um, so, and yes, it would be useful for club meetings. Jar, how do you cope with a squad of 40 players of varying talents? Um, I suppose if it's, it's a difficult one, um, Jar, like from a point of view of, I suppose with, with a group of 40, you're probably having them into groups of tr maybe three separate groups at training sessions. There would be a, a varying opinion on putting the stronger lads with the stronger lads, the weaker lads, the weaker lads, and the middle lads together, just that they're able to compete at their own level. Um, I wouldn't say do that every night, and I would say mix and match it, um, varying, because kids know if they're not, if a child is put in a weak team, he knows it. So from a social, psychosocial point of view, you don't want to be telling the child at the age of 10, 11, 12 that he's not good enough. So what I'd suggest is that maybe once out of every five sessions, you might put the stronger kids with the stronger kids. But what you'll find is the weaker kids will try to aspire to be like the stronger kids. So by putting them in together, they might improve. As I said, from a player's perspective, um, I suppose the, the, the opinion from a playing perspective, the opinion would be to get them better, play at their own level where they can, they can succeed. Um, but from, a, as I said, from a social perspective, you don't want kids going into school saying he's on the C team or he's on the B team. So from that, what I do is, as I said, with a group of 40, I'd imagine you'd have, you've plenty of coaches, break them into groups of, um, groups of three or three groups. And as I said, a variant, varying abilities, um, wouldn't go strong every night and I wouldn't go the weakest lads, but I'd mix and match, um, because they, they will aspire, as I said, the weak kid will aspire to do what the strong kid does. And if the, if the weak kid is only seeing stuff at, a, at the, that uh, the rest of the weak kids are able to do, they don't have an incentive to improve um, themselves what they're saying. As I said, massive varying opinion on that. I'm not going to say that's the best way. I'm just giving the opinion of what's out there at the moment. Um, I will send what I will do. I won't send out the mind. I won't send out um, email address. What I do is I'll put everything on Dropbox. So, but what I'll do is on my Twitter page, I will, I will share the Dropbox. So you can just go onto the Dropbox and you can take down whatever you want. There's a load of content there already, but I'll put up whatever's there tonight um, and the blank templates on Word form, Word document, so you can drag it from that and you can build it out. Do you have county development squads for regions or the county as a whole? In Cork, we have regional development squads at under 14. We have eight teams, eight different regions in hurling and football. Uh, they go to four at under 15 and 16. Um, but there's no development squad activity for the rest of this year because of the, the coronavirus. Um, so they've been stood down for the year. So players will be playing with their clubs and schools only for the rest of the year. Um, if a seven-year-old is far more advanced than the rest of the team, would you send him up to the eight-year-olds? Again, that is up to that is up to yourselves. Um, I know a lot of clubs have policies on that now that they don't want children going up in age group because if, let's say, that seven-year-old might be very, very good, but if he goes up and there's another child in his class, goes, oh, but there's seven boys from that class, or from my son's class in the under eight group, can he go up as well? And that child mightn't be at the level. Um, so I'd say every now and again, there's no harm in it. There's no harm in just one sort of six, every, every five, six sessions, going up and playing a game or doing a training session. But I don't, I think players should play at their own, at their own age group. Um, but as I said, it's just, it causes too much conflict from, once there's a kind of a rule set and there's a precedent set, if you're, if let's say, if, you, if it is your son, let's say we're speaking of the seven-year-old, very good seven-year-old playing with the under eights, it's not, as I said, if another under seven child or parent wants their child to go up, um, but that child mightn't be anywhere near good enough and might just be completely out of their depth up there. Um, 
it's hard to tell that parent no then. So I said, it's up to each club. I won't say any club what their policy should, shouldn't, should or should not be. But I would recommend that children play with their age group predominantly. As I said, once every six, seven sessions or if they're very short for a blitz, if to fill up numbers. But I don't think it should be a, a full-time thing. But that's, again, my own opinion, massive varying opinions on it. Any last questions? I'll give it two more minutes um, if anyone wants to fire anything regarding that. I said, just on the content we went through tonight, as I said, it was just, um, it's just to give you an idea of, of how simple it can be to plan. Um, that it's not a huge time load, not a huge workload. Put in place a small bit of time. As I said, if you have the template and five or six coaches sitting around the table, or the two or three coaches sitting around the table on a night, you can see that it's very, very easy to, um, to come up with what the actual content should be. So don't be afraid to, to plan, plan for that kind of stuff. Um, I hope you got some benefit out of it. If there's any feedback, feel free to um, send it on to, just message me back on the Twitter if you don't mind. Um, just, just might be, might just, just for, us, for all, our own sake going forward, was it beneficial? Did the content, um, I suppose, was the setup good and stuff like that? So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. If not, um, Mitchell Crop Park up doing the fund. No, I don't, Des, I don't know when they're, when they're going to do the, when it's supposed to be done. I'd say everything is on hold now. You'd love to think that with it on hold now, they'll all get it done in the next few weeks. Um, but I'd say probably not. All right. So as I said, I'll get everything up in Dropbox. Thanks all for the time. As I said, throw back some comments. Um, anything you think you can prove on. I don't need any thanks or anything like that. As I said, it's part of my job. But if there's anything you want to throw back to me, um, things to improve, I'd be grateful to help. Okay. Thanks, folks. I'm going to end it there. Bye-bye.